God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Well, good morning, church. We, we do praise God for being in the house of prayer once again. Uh, we want to share a thought with you this morning. We're going to be taking our assignment from the book of Romans and the 12th chapter, reading from the New International Version. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Also, Psalm 143 in verse 10 says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. Teach me to do your will. I want to speak this morning from the subject, embracing the will of God, embracing the will of God. A couple of weeks ago, in our reverse Bible study, reverse Bible study is where members of the church bring the questions to the pastor to answer and to address one of the questions that came forth was a question that was common, a question that I had entertained through the years in ministry. And that is simply, how do we know the will of God? And I'm not going to relitigate the lesson that I talked about that day, but some of the things that I addressed was the idea that when we think about the will of God, it's often only on the pragmatic level. It basically goes around questions, practical questions. And there's nothing wrong with those questions. But when we think about God's will, it often goes around questions. If I were to ask the question, who here desires to know God's will? Or who here desires to be in God's will? I would venture that many hands, if not all hands, would go up. In fact, I would dare say if anyone walked into this church regardless of their background, maybe someone who hasn't been in church ever, and the question is put to them, would you like to know, do you desire to know the will of God? The hands would go up. Would you desire to be in the will of God? And by the way, there's a difference in knowing the will of God and being in the will of God. Because you can know the will of God 
and never be in the will of God. Because it's not the hearers of the word, but it's the doers. By the end of the message, I would challenge you about your answer to that question. Would I really want to be in the will of God? By the end of the message, I'm not going to ask it again, but I would challenge you to ask yourself that question. Do I really desire God's will in my life? Some people take the lazy way out. They throw all of the responsibility back on God. They would say, really doesn't matter what God's will is because it's going to happen anyway. You've heard them say, if God wants me to have it, he'll make it happen. If God doesn't want me to do this, it won't happen. And that's not really accurate because as strange as it may sound, It's possible for God to want something for you, and it never happened. Consider all through the scriptures. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but the wicked still die. The New Testament tells us the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's clear it's not God's will that any perish. Yet thousands are perishing every day, despite God's will. Recall Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you were not willing. I wanted, but you were not. So the idea that whatever God wants will happen anyway, regardless of you, is not accurate. But the will of God is of dire importance to the believers. Paul, in his prayer for the church, says this, for this reason also, since the day I heard it, Do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The problem with knowing, understanding, grabbing, or obtaining the will of God is the reality, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So God doesn't think like us. God's will for you is not something that you decide for yourself. It's something you discover for yourself. God's will for you happens long before you're even here told Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Telling Jeremiah, your destiny was determined a long time ago. My will for you was determined a long time ago. And that's why some preachers struggle because they feel that maybe I ought to be a minister. Maybe I ought to be a pastor. 
and they decide that that's the thing that they ought to do. But your assignment from God, whatever that may be, whether it be preaching, ministry, whatever it is, is something that God sets for you. It's not something you set for yourself. Just because you want to preach doesn't mean you should be preaching. I know people want to sing. And that's not God's will for their lives. <laughs> Paul made it clear concerning himself. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. To the Ephesians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. To the Colossians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. If you take on a ministry that God didn't assign you to, it's going to be an uphill battle. It's not going to be flourishing. It will be struggle. So the will of God, there are many ways in which to approach the idea, the concept of discovering, discerning God's will. In our text, he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here, he uses the term of the perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is what God has designed specifically for you. Then there is the permissive will of God. The permissive will of God is what God allows you to get away with. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees about marriage and divorce. They said to him, Jesus, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away. He said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So here he's saying, just because you got away with it, just because God allowed it, doesn't mean that that was his design for you. The real believer in Jesus Christ is only interested in the perfect will of God. The true Christian is one who pursues his perfect will. You're not comfortable or satisfied with just being in the permissive will. Just because God doesn't strike you down doesn't mean you're doing the right thing. And that ought not to be a low bar to reach for. Loving God means keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So this should not be a big deal for us to say, I'm not just interested in what I can get away with and still be a Christian. I'm in pursuit of his divine and perfect will. Now, we can look at the will of God in three different ways. The revealed will, the perceived will, and the hidden will of God. The revealed will of God. The revealed will of God is what God has already provided you. Revelation that he has already extended to you that expressively tells you what he's about. It's what we get in the word of God. Many of us want to know what God's will is for us. We struggle because we can't understand some of the things he's doing. Why does he allow certain things to happen? But the real challenge is how much 
have we dedicated ourselves to the revealed will of God? How much have we put into reading our Bible? Many have had those questions that we laid out in the beginning of the message. Who should I marry? Where should I live? Is this the right job for me? But they never read their Bible. In fact, many, the only time they hear the word of God is on Sunday morning. I'm preaching hard now. And it goes well also, do you share the word of God with your children, your grandchildren? Or do you leave that to your church? Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, has 176 verses. And every one of those verses gives testimony to the word of God. It uses different phrases, the commandments, instructions, the law. But every verse talks about the word of God and the value and importance of it. Verse 9, how can a young person stay on the path of purity by living according to your word? Verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. 105, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. 130, the unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. And of course, in our New Testament, all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We have so much of God's will revealed to us in the scriptures. So before you start longing for God's will or lamenting that you don't know God's will, perhaps we should question ourselves how much of the Bible, how much of the scriptures do we absorb? Do we read it every day? When was the last time we turn off the TV, shut down the internet, and dig into God's word, his revealed will. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. When you desire God's word and have that hunger to know his will, he will reach out to you. How much of a passion do we have to hear the word of God? Are we satisfied with whatever comes out on Sunday morning? If we miss Sunday, what kind of effort do we put into getting the word of God? Don't expect to get on Sunday morning what you don't crave all week long. Let's talk about the hidden will of God. The hidden will of God refers to the things of God that you may never understand. And that's a struggle for a lot of people. It bothers them that God is doing something that makes no sense to them. Paul says, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. There are just some things you're not going to know about God. There are some things that will not make any sense to you. There are answers that are not going to come 
on this side of heaven. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. There's not a lot of light in shadows. And there are just some things in this life that you're never going to understand. The hidden will of God. Is that going to be okay with you? That God doesn't have to explain everything to me before I worship him. And then there is the perceived will of God. That's the area that we are most familiar with. What does God want me to do? What is his will for my life? What is my assignment? What does he expect from me? The perceived will. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. So you have those aspects of God's will. But before you want to grab hold of his perceived will, or even attempt to understand his hidden will. Again, how much of his revealed will do we engage in? We're all familiar with the story of Samson, one of the heroes of the Bible. We know the story. He's the one that kills a lion with his bare hands. He brings down a pagan temple. We read a portion of his life in Judges, the 14th chapter. Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Isn't that a good reason to get married? (laughs) But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Here's a profound verse. They didn't know that it was of the Lord. This was God's will. But how could something that is of the Lord look like this? How could God's will end up looking like this? Because we think that if we could know God's will, everything would work out great. If I could just discern what God wants for me, I know that things will go my way. But being In God's will means you may not always get what you want. Joseph was in God's will and he was betrayed, thrown in a pit and sold into slavery. He stayed in God's will and he was falsely accused and thrown into prison for years. David prayed. He wanted to build God a temple, a noble thought. Why should we live in houses of stone and the Ark of the Covenant remain in a tent? So David says, I'm going to build a temple to my God. But God didn't want it. He didn't want David to do that. So in Chronicles, he says, my son, talking to Solomon, I wanted to build a temple to honor The name of the Lord, my God, David told him. But the Lord said to me, you have killed many men 
in the battles you have fought. And since you have shed so much blood in my sight, you will not be the one to build a temple to honor my name. He wanted to do a good thing, but God told him, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to build a temple. You can pay for it. You can get things ready and prepare it. But Solomon will build my temple. Being in God's will means you don't always get what you want. Being in God's will means you may not be able to do everything you want. Stephen was in the will of God and he was stoned to death. Paul lived by the will of God and he was executed and beheaded. Peter was in the will of God and was crucified upside down. And of course, Jesus was in the will of God, and they slaughtered him. Being in the will of God may cost you everything. One of my all-time favorite movies is Amadeus. It's a story about Mozart, a very accomplished musician. And the story of Amadeus tells it through the eyes of Salieri. Now, Salieri, unlike Mozart, was a very religious man. He was devoted to God. All he ever wanted to do was to be a musician for God. And he couldn't understand why God would give a gift to someone who was opposite him. A vulgar man, a womanizer, someone who had no regard for religion. And so Salieri struggled with the will of God. Grazie, signore. Every day, sometimes for hours, I would pray. Lord, please. I prayed as I had never prayed before. Dear God, enter me now me with one piece of true music, one piece with your breath in it, so I know that you love me. All I ever wanted was to sing to God. He gave me that longing and then made me mute. Why? Tell me that. If he didn't want me to praise him with music, why implant the desire? Like a lust in my body. And then deny me the talent. From now on, we are enemies. You and I. Because you choose for your instrument a boastful, lustful, smutty, infantile boy and give me for reward only the ability to recognize because you are unjust unfair unkind I will block you I swear it Sayeri struggled understanding the will of God he was not able to accept God's will for him, for his life, because God didn't meet 
his expectations. Because being in the will of God means you don't always get what you want. You don't get to do everything you want to do. But nothing brings you into the will of God like surrender. Surrender will give you what all the studying in the world will never give you. Which brings us to the subject of submission. Submission is a word and a concept that we by nature resist, some more than others. What does it mean to submit? What does it mean to surrender, to give up? And yet we are instructed that the way to God is through submission. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit to God and be at peace with him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. And Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. Submission is something we think slaves ought to do. Submission is something that servants do. Slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. So we think of submission, something that a slave does. Why would we want to embrace that idea for ourselves? We're told to submit to the pastors. <laughs> Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as men who will have to give an account. Let them do this joyfully and not sadly, for that would be of no advantage to you. Submission. Why should we have to do that? Submission is often thought something that women are supposed to do. The Bible says so. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do the Lord. So many of us will feel like that's not something I'm ready to do. That doesn't come easy to me to submit. That's something women are supposed to do. And they get that verse from Ephesians 5. We hear it all the time in the evangelical churches. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. But the verse before it that isn't always quoted says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So here, it's not just the women that are supposed to submit. Everybody is supposed to submit to one another. Read this chapter in the New Living Translation. It makes it a little clearer. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Down in verse 25, for husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. So submission isn't just something for slaves. It's not just something for wives. It's something that we all are supposed to be willing and able to do. Why do we have a problem with submission? Because where there is no disagreement, there's no need for submission. Submission only comes into play when there's a disagreement on what should be done. If I say, hey, come with me, let's go downtown, and you're okay with that, 
You don't have to submit. We just go downtown. But when I ask you to do something that you don't agree with, now is a call for submission. So if you're in agreement, if what you're being asked to do, you're okay with, that's not submission. It's only when you're being asked to do something that you don't want to do, that you don't agree with, that's when submission comes in. We see this so clearly in the life of Jesus because it applies to God. What happens when God is asking something of you that you don't agree with? When God wants you to do something that doesn't set well with you, the only thing that you can do is to submit. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus in that garden said, I don't want to do this. And he wrestled with God. And said, could you find another way? Is it possible for this to go down another way? And when he got to that point of disagreement, where he realizes there was no other way, Jesus chose to submit and said, I'll do it. I don't like it, but I'll do it. Submission leads to promotion and growth. Submission leads to spiritual promotion and spiritual growth. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways. You want to know the will of God? It's not about reading books. It's not about looking for signs. It's about submitting to his will. Surrendering to God is the greatest victory you'll ever win. When we say, Lord, you are the potter and I am the clay. Lord, I don't understand what you're asking of me. Lord, I don't see why it has to be this way. But yet there's something in me that says, yes, Lord. And if we can bring ourselves to that place to say, yes, Lord, to your will. Yes, I'll do what you want. Yes, I'll do what you say. It may not be what I want. It may not feel good in my life. But deep in my heart, I say, yes, Lord. My mind says, yes, Lord. My soul says, yes, Lord. And when I get to that place where it doesn't feel good and I don't want to do it and I push back, I will still say of the Lord, he is my strength and my fortress. And I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise will always be in my mouth. Even if I don't want to go. Even if it makes no sense for me. Lord, have your way in my life. Lord, I would choose a different way. Lord, I'm not comfortable with the way that you're leading me. But lead me to the rock that is higher than I. My soul says yes. My heart says yes. My mind says yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your ways. Yes, Lord. Bring me through. Yes, Lord. Take me higher. Yes, Lord. Have your way. Say yes to God's will. All to Jesus.